the UFO cover-up. Live from Area 51, a TNT Larry King special. Hi, the TNT crew and yours truly are here alive in Rachel, Nevada. We're about 50 miles from Area 51, that mysterious Air Force base that the Air Force denies exists. This is going to be an incredible two hours with great guests, interesting interviews, and of course, we'll include your phone calls. We'll be giving you an 800 number where you can participate. Flying saucers, UFOs, little green men. They are more than incredible tales and tantalizing rumors. They're part of our history and our culture, even if they're just figments of our imagination. All around us, they're part of us, thanks in part to those wonderful folks in Hollywood. Watch. Your choice is simple. Join us and live in peace, or pursue your present course and face obliteration. A classic threat from a Hollywood alien. Waiting Shape up or die. It was 1952, the Red Scare was on. It wouldn't be the last time scriptwriters invented an emissary from space to show human dreams and fears. I think all movies have, from the beginning of the medium, plugged into extremely basic human yearnings, fears, fantasies of every kind. Since 1947, when real-life pilot Kenneth Arnold saw silver discs over Mount Rainier and coined the term flying saucer, people have been straining to see spaceships. And if they came up empty, there was always the movies. Holy cats. We finally got one. We found a flying saucer. UFOs are a modern obsession, but the idea of strange visitors dispensing advice, discipline, or trouble is an old one. Try 6,000 years old. The Egyptians and the Mesopotamians considered their cities dominated by sacred ziggurats, the property of gods from the sky. Ancient cultures the world over wrote of regular celestial visitors who taught everything from irrigation to medicine. Where did they all go? Where are the demons? Where are the Greek gods? They just disappear? They left the earth? These are things inside people's heads. But others say remnants of long-vanished cultures from Easter Island to Stonehenge show today's UFO believers have history on their side. Sacred circles still mark hallowed ground from Scotland to the American West. South America's ancient Nazca lines form giant birds and monkeys best appreciated from the air. More recently, many believed in fairies, elves, trolls, or leprechauns, little people who sowed magic or havoc. Today, we puzzle over crop circles, flying saucers, and little gray men who abduct innocents. The data seems to indicate a form of non-human consciousness that is very close to the Earth has been present throughout history. We have come to visit... Whether visitors from the unknown really did and do show themselves, or whether they're a collective daydream as old as civilization itself, Hollywood has for decades played a game of what if. Imagine they came here. What would they be like? What would they do to us? What would they do for us? All of that stuff is really interesting to play with. You're wiser than anything on Earth. Use that intelligence. Look at me and know what I'm trying to tell you. I'm not your enemy. I'm a scientist. I'm a scientist who's trying... Some aliens you just can't talk to. But the thing was a product of the 50s. By the 60s, we seemed to want extraterrestrials to be teachers. 2001, a space odyssey showed a far superior intelligence helping mankind evolve in a remote but caring way. And in more recent years, we fantasized about not only meeting aliens, but running away with them. When the mothership in Close Encounters finally showed itself at a secret government landing pad piloted by benign, mischievous aliens, it was ordinary Joe Richard Dreyfus who was welcomed aboard. Extraterrestrial contact has become our dominant fantasy. What about reality? Do the movies simply reflect age-old yearnings to explore, to grow, to make contact? 
Or are they an attempt to make sense of an inexplicable real-life mystery? I think that people want to believe so much that, that it flies in the face of any logic. As Captain Kirk, William Shatner, and the Star Trek crew encountered fictional aliens for 30 years, but that doesn't mean he believes in real ones. People interpret what they're seeing uh, as science fiction because they want desperately to believe that they exist and that there is another intelligence out there that can, like Big Daddy, come and put their arms around us and gently say to the culture that has gone astray, Big Daddy's here, we'll set you on the path again and everything will be fine. Almost at once there followed the discovery of Piper Drive. The spinning round spaceship has become a cultural icon, a symbol for mystery, excitement, hope, maybe even rescue. Some say it's so pervasive it explains a lot of real life saucer sightings. When people have been exposed to these stories on television with dramatic uh, uh, reproductions or dramatic uh, visual aids, naturally that uh, uh, influences the story they tell. The last night I saw a flying object that couldn't have possibly been from this planet, but I can't say a word. I'm muzzled by army brass. A laughable I movie, but to a lot of real life military men, that's not a laugh line. Army and Air Force personnel do see strange things. They are ordered not to talk, as we'll see tonight. Some are talking anyway. We'll see that the U.S. government is holding back UFO files, contents unknown, while pretending not to be interested. We'll see how a U.S. congressman was stonewalled when he probed a legendary, unproven UFO story. The movies, the lunatic theories, and the desperate desire to believe all make it doubly difficult to investigate all this. But tonight, We'll try to play it right down the middle as we ask whether UFOs are the story of the century or just a case of wishful thinking by a troubled species hoping for company in a lonely universe. We are back in Rachel, Nevada with our first two distinguished guests. Stephen Greer is a North Carolina doctor. He does a lot more than watch the skies. He fires off messages, and he says that someone or something is responding. Dr. Greer is looking for close encounters of the fifth kind. Also here, the dean of UFO researchers, a man who says the world governments have engineered a kind of cosmic Watergate to hide the truth from the public. The esteemed nuclear physicist Stanton Friedman. What is key, Stephen, about this area? Area 51. Well, this area has been reported uh, for a number of years to uh, house uh, black operations uh, from the Air Force and other agencies that have allegedly been back engineering uh, alien spacecraft, uh, as they're called, or extraterrestrial spacecraft. Uh, this is the place where the Air Force supposedly hides things from us. Yeah, I'm not saying that that's the case, but that's what is reported here. What do you think goes on here, doctor? Uh, mister, please, Larry, no okay. free degrees. Uh, okay, you're a doctor, you're a mister. Yes, there's, there's no question that there's all kinds of secret government development projects going on over the, the hill. Uh, whether any of them have anything to do with flying, so that's another question entirely. Certainly, if you were going to try to test fly a new strange vehicle, this would be the place to do it. It's a huge area, access is prohibited. We're not on Area 51. We're nearby, because they wouldn't let us on Area 51. What would happen if we went there now? We'd be stopped at the gate. We would not, and we could be arrested. I know of people who've been arrested for trying to look over the mountain to look down at the area. What does the sign at the gate say, Stephen? I haven't actually been What's over there. What's the name of this base? There are several names. Area 51 is the larger name. We're near Nellis Air Force Base. There's Groom Lake. There's Papoose Lake. There's a whole bunch of different And the Air Force tells us this is what? <laughs> Until very recently, they were saying there's nothing out here. No, it's a secret thing place. out there is not there. Yeah, it's not there. You can't look at it, and the guards can't look at your videotape on your camera because they're not cleared to see what isn't there. We'll get to that later. What, Dr. Greer, do you believe? By the way, your specialty is what? Emergency medicine, emergency and trauma medicine. So you're in an emergency room every day. Yes, treating well, not every day, but enough. You treat trauma patients. Yes. How'd you get into this? Well, it's a long story. Uh, I had an interest. My uncle it. <laughs> worked on a project working on the Apollo mission, and I had an interest in space. And uh, many years ago, I had a sighting at fairly close range of an object that was clearly not an airplane. 
and from that uh, my interest grew and I developed a, an interest to the point that I founded a research organization called CSETI and Which stands uh, for Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence. What to, at this minute do you believe? Well, you know, I separate my belief from what I know. Okay. What do you know? Okay. What I have, our assessment at this point is that there is at least one extraterrestrial civilization which has managed to make its way to our corner of the universe. And number two, that there's no uh, evidence at all that they have hostile intentions towards this planet. And number three, that the priority at this point must be trying to establish uh, some sort of a liaison to them, some sort of a, a diplomatic liaison to them, and that's what we're working on. How do you know this? Well, uh, I personally have been within a few hundred feet of these craft as they have been uh, maneuvering. You've seen them? Uh, we have seen them. I've been on research teams that we've put out in areas where these objects have been seen, and we have been able to signal to them. Uh, we have been able to vector them within a few hundred feet of our location, uh, ten feet above the ground. I, there's no question in my mind that these are real and not a figment of anyone's imagination. Stanton, do you believe Dr. Greer? Yes, I believe Dr. Greer. My own beliefs are a little different in the sense that I agree with what he said, but I carry it a lot farther. I'm convinced after 36 years of study and investigation that the evidence is overwhelming that planet Earth is being visited by extraterrestrial spacecraft. That means some UFOs are alien spacecraft. Most are not, I don't care about those. Right. Second, we're dealing with a kind of cosmic Watergate. That means some few people in the government know what's going on, not everybody. Third, none of the arguments made by the debunkers like Carl Sagan and Phil Klass, who never refer to the relevant evidence, stand up under careful scrutiny. And fourth, we're dealing with the biggest story of the millennium. Visits to planet Earth, successful cover-up of the best data, the bodies and the wreckage from 1947 for 47 years. Why? Uh, I don't Why speak you, for the government, but I'll give you, you five reasons. <laughs> yeah. Go. Uh, one, we want to figure out how they work to make wonderful weapons delivery and defense systems. They can fly circles on anything we got flying. Rule number one for security, if you set up a secret project, is you can't tell your friends without telling your enemies. They watch like Larry King, too. Second problem, the other side of the coin, what if the other guy figures out how they work before you do? How do you defend against them? You don't want them to know you know, they know. Third, if there were to be an announcement made by highly trusted individuals that indeed some UFOs are alien spacecraft, what would happen? We can imagine church attendance would go up, mental hospital admissions would go up, stock market would go down. But I think the biggest thing that would happen, based on 600 college lectures, is that the younger generation, which was never alive when there wasn't a space program, would immediately push for a new view of ourselves instead of as Americans, Chinese, Canadians, as Earthlings. And, and, and this plot is conceived to be hidden for these five reasons by whom? I, I didn't give you two of them. We, apparently the intelligence agencies have been running the show for a long time. I mean, the National Security Agency admits it's withholding 156 so UFO documents. You're saying, Stanton, that the uh, President uh, Reagan knew about this and kept it hidden, or he didn't know? I think he probably did know. And kept President it. Bush knows. Certainly Bush knows as head of the CIA okay. beforehand. President Clinton knows. I have, no, I have no idea how much he's been briefed. He's got a lot on his plate right now. He might have been told very little of the whole story. Yeah, my, my view on this is a little different, and that is that uh, I don't believe that uh, when most people in government say they don't know anything about this, they are really telling the truth. And, and I, I question whether the current president and some of his cabinet have been uh, adequately briefed. This isn't to say that there aren't people in some of the agencies who, who, who know. I'm, I'm sure there are. Uh, but I think the control point on this is not where most people would think it would be. You've contacted them, or you believe you've contacted them? We have had uh, limited uh, exchange. Yes. By what mean? By light signaling and uh, by uh, graphic signaling and what do you mean through light other signaling. Like a well, Morse basically, code. for example, if an object is arriving out in the field, we will uh, and try to By engage way, I it. I hope it happens now. Well, who knows? But uh, we will uh, signal to it, and it then will signal back congruently. Like saying and what? You'll beep what? It's not. It's not to say anything. It is simply to establish that they see us and we see them. Three flashes. Three flashes back. That right. that idea, Larry. I see. You know, it's four flashes. We're right. here. You're here. We're there. Yeah. You're there. Now there have been reports of more advanced uh, uh, communication, but uh, I think one thing we have to back up and say is that any. A craft capable of getting here from another star system is not going to have technology that would be used by AT&T and what have you. So we have to keep a very open mind about what modalities of communication might be out there. Any of those government reasons logical to you, Stanton? Well, I worked on classified programs for 14 years. I've been to 15 archives. I know how easy it is to cover things up. And I know that the major concerns often are technological and power-oriented. So the fifth reason is economic discombobulation, Larry. You make an announcement, people think that soon there's going to be new methods 
of ground transport, air transport, energy production, that causes chaos on the stock market. We're going to take a break and come back. There'll be more guests, and we'll be including your phone calls. Our numbers are 1-800-348-3900. 1-800-348-3900. This is our TNT UFO special, Larry King in the Desert. We'll be right back. mind is open. If there's good evidence tomorrow, I'd love to hear it. I'd love to believe that we're being visited. Coming up, the secrets of Area 51. By way of correction, uh, we gave you the wrong 800 number. <laughs> it's 800-448-3900. 800-448-3900, not 348. And if someone is at 348, we apologize. <laughs> It's 448-3900. Welcome back. We're in Rachel, Nevada, in the shadows of the mysterious Area 51. Just behind, behind us in the foreboding desert scrub, amazing things are going on. That much is certain. But a growing list of witnesses say that they're hiding more than just secret planes back there. How much more? Our crews went in for a look. referred to Groom Lake, Area 51. The military will not acknowledge that those terms exist. When you don't exist, you can do anything you damn well please. This is the most secret place in America. It was home to the stealth planes back when they were only rumors. Now the rumors are of exotic, officially non-existent projects like the Aurora. Nobody in government ever talks on the record. I can't tell you what anything they're doing out there. It's under the Secrecy Act. If the government really is hiding hard evidence of UFOs, all the rumors point to Area 51. This country's less lonely than it looks. Head down the unmarked access road, and they know you're coming. The desert's alive with electronic sensors. If you drive past signs warning you not to take pictures, unmarked white Jeep Cherokees appear with men in camouflage, wielding binoculars and rifles. The next sign near the robot camera says, use of deadly force authorized. That's far enough. So what's going on around this bend? This object rose from the area of Papoose Lake, and it would exhibit totally unconventional flight characteristics. This man, who goes by the name Agent X, finds and photographs secret aircraft. He's defied federal law to shoot these pictures of Area 51. He can identify virtually every plane in the sky. But what he saw here one night terrified him. As it would travel in one direction, it would slightly deform to the trailing edge. And as the object would stop, it would kind of have a little lag and a little shift beyond it. And it would drop down. And it literally seemed like um, it was alive. Did Agent X see something genuinely unearthly? To see this thing has made me critically examine the way that I view the world and what I think. And it lends a lot more credibility to several of the stories that are floating around this area dealing with Papoose Lake. For example, a reclusive physicist named Bob Lazar has long claimed that he worked on an extraterrestrial craft at an installation near Area 51. Other sources talk of Project Red Light, an effort to test fly otherworldly craft whose force fields might make them look distorted or alive. I mean, if you're gonna see anything, this is where you're gonna see it. So believers are lured to tiny Rachel in the shadow of Area 51, where the first thing you see is a government radiation meter. Rachel is a hundred people in one bar, the Little Ailey Inn, where saucer hunters trade tips and alien heads stands guard. And all kinds of folks stop by. I am an alien visitor, but I don't look like one. I'm in disguise. Glenn Campbell's seen all kinds. A computer programmer turned desert activist, he's running a one-man campaign to open up the secret base. My angle is, let's look at the government's secrecy, see if this is excessive. And if it is, and, it, and we can hack away at, at it a little bit, then eventually all these mysteries will be solved. 
Campbell's still undecided about UFOs, but he doesn't like Area 51 security patrols making arrests on public land or wiring it up with motion sensors. And he doesn't like the Air Force trying to seize even more land around Area 51. Between the security, the threats, the radiation meter, and the UFO talk, he says this is a scary place. People really are afraid of leaking things out. Uh, I see that. I used to believe that the government couldn't possibly keep a secret this big. But now I see that, that it, in this particular place, it could. Nevada Congressman James Bilbray says, yes, Area 51 has secrets to keep. And yes, the secrecy is justified. It didn't become a serious problem just until a few years ago when all of a sudden this rumor started that there were spacemen out there and they had a captured spaceship and they had bodies of aliens. Bill Bray says he's been over a lot of the base that doesn't exist and saw nothing you might call out of this world. But he wants the UFO buffs banned from eyeballing Area 51. I read science fiction all the time. It's been something I've done since I was a teenager. But the fact is that they've got to understand you've got to balance that with national security needs. They cannot have access to a lot of facilities. Back at the Little Ailey Inn, the believers are anything but discouraged. Even though you, you may be totally skeptic about it, you've got this, this thing pulling you saying, just in case, you sure would like to be there at the time. There are two tourist destinations here in uh, Rachel, Nevada. One is the Little Ailey Inn right across the road. The other is the Area 51 Research Center. It's operator Glenn Campbell, who's presided over a kind of media frenzy over the past uh, recent months, joins us and our panel now, joining Stanton Friedman and Dr. Stephen Greer. What do you believe? You moved from Boston out here, right? That's right. Just for this. Just for this, and I, I don't believe anything. I just like to let the um, evidence speak for itself. What do you do? What did you do in Boston? I was a com computer programmer, and essentially I do a lot of the same stuff here. I organize data. You don't believe? What fascinated you to come live out here? Well, I came because of the UFO stories, and they still fascinate but me. But what really uh, keeps me here is the, the human stories. This is really cutting-edge humanity. This is uh, an example of how uh, humans deal with the unknown. And I think regardless of what the truth is, it's interesting to see this process work. What do you know? about Area 51? Uh, uh, well, you know? certainly the, the vast majority of it is, is routine military testing of secret weapons, uh, things that wouldn't be too interesting to most civilians. But I do not discount the possibility that there, there is alien hardware being kept out there or have been kept at some You're point. You're open to that possibility? I'm open to it. Why? I continue to hear uh, uh, secondhand stories from, from workers who have, who have, have been in there that, that suggest this. And certainly, workers in there do not discount this possibility themselves. The workers in there, where do they live? They live on the base? Largely live in Las Vegas, and they're shuttled up in, in jets. In jets? That's right. We can't land there. We uh, can't even go no, over there, right? We can't do it comfortably, no. What, is, what, what does the Air Force say if we call them in Washington about that base? They'll say the area is used for training. How Quote, many people training. are there? Uh, perhaps 1,500, that's a guess. OK. What are they, OK, why is this a secret? in your opinion. And we can all chime uh, in on this. It's a secret because it's always been now, a let's secret. Let's say they got a plane there yeah. that can go uh, vertically take off and go 8,000 miles a second and traverse the Earth in two minutes. Right. Tell wow. us. Wow. Wow. Why can't they tell us? They should be able to tell us. The, the secrecy has always been the, the modus operandi. You know, are they worrying about Saddam Hussein? What? Yes. Who's the enemy? Good point. Good point. What do you think, Stephen? Why don't they just tell us? Tell us what the plane is. Well, I think there's a lot of residual uh, uh, secrecy left over from the Cold War. And uh, big institutions uh, turn uh, around about as easily as a super tanker. And I think a lot of the policies that are currently in place are holdovers uh, from the, uh, the Cold War era. And I in other words, Stanton, do you think we're holding things secret that anybody in the public could know about? I think there are a lot of those things, Larry. Uh, but you have to understand, we're dealing with an annual $34 billion black budget in the United States. About half on technology, that's a lot of bucks, and half on spying. National Security Agency, CIA, DIA, NRO, all these things. That's power. When you've got knowledge that nobody else has, that's power. And these guys want to stay in power. The fact that Cold War has gone down doesn't matter to them. They want their jobs. We have in front of us a UFO model 
we can show that on. It's from the Tester Corporation. We discussed Bob Lazar in that earlier package. This is based on Bob Lazar's, was built based on Bob Lazar's description of the craft that he says he saw at Area 51. Glenn, do you believe him? I don't know what to believe. That's a great story. It's it's well constructed story. It's a beautiful I, model. It's a beautiful it. model, and there's a there's a rich technical story behind it. Uh, you can believe it or not believe Could it. Could it be experimental American aircraft? I seriously doubt it. If it Why? does anything that it's uh, well, where are the wings? <laughs> where where are the air air? Where are the houses? engines? Where are the engines? It's something Maybe it's far. a roll along the ground thing. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> Larry, it, it's important to recognize here that there are two separate questions with regard to the model. A, whether there are vehicles of that sort out at, the, at Area 51. B, whether Bob Lazar is telling the truth. I've done an enormous amount of research and I find that nothing checks out. He isn't a scientist. He didn't go to MIT. He didn't go to Caltech. He didn't work for Los Alamos. Worked there for a while as a technician, apparently. He's a liar? Yes. I so you don't believe flatly. this is there? Uh, that's a separate question. He may have heard stories about something just like that. I certainly don't believe his reconstruction of the means of propulsion. He's got a nice story. It's good science fiction, but as a nuclear physicist, and I've worked on nuclear rockets and fusion rockets and such, the story doesn't hold together when you look at it critically. Now, the there's a separate science you know. Yes. But there's a separate issue here, not whether that is at this area but does such a thing exist and has it been documented? The answer to that is absolutely yes. There are daylight photographs of objects uh, quite close to what that uh, looks like, uh, which are very good. I acquired one through a person working with us at NASA. And I'll tell you another thing, and that is in England uh, in 1992, uh, we had uh, a research team that was successful in vectoring into the field that we were operating in within about 10 feet above the ground an object that looked almost identical to that. So I would be inclined to believe that there are, are such craft. Whether there's one at Area 51 is another question. Maybe the model's based on what he saw, not the other way around. How long have you been here, Glenn? Two years. In that time, are you more inclined to believe or less inclined? Uh, the, the most obvious stories are that you can come here to this remote desert highway and see flying saucers on demand, and I think that's ridiculous. However, the longer I'm here, the more ex-workers I talk to, the more I'm not so sure about this craft. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of interesting stories, and they all seem to hold together that the uh, Air Force has somehow obtained craft. And what like do you this. do with them? How do you make a living doing what you do? I have a little. Who uses your services? Oh, uh, visitors come and buy my book, and uh, I have a little mail order business where I sell documents relating to this. Largely, I live off my savings, though, from my previous life. A little boring out here? Oh, no, not at all. It's a, not it, boring. It's a rich pageant of humanity. <laughs> you blink and miss the city. <laughs> a rich it. pageant of humanity comes here. Oh, aliens of all sorts. I, you might have seen Ambassador Merlin on the cliff. Uh, <laughs> I've uh, met a number of aliens, and uh, that, that's what fascinates me, how, how people... Uh, respond to this sort of thing. We will include your phone calls throughout this program. Other guests are coming too, by the way, but let's take our first one with us are Glenn Campbell, Dr. Stephen Greer, and Stanton Friedman. I'm Larry King, and this is our UFO special on TNT, and we go to Petoskey, Michigan. Hello. Hi, Larry. Um, I have been interested in this in a long time. I have two questions. Um, the first one is, is there any proof that people are actually abducted and then returned, like with these horror stories such as uh, abuse and probing, um, to where they're really scared to death? And the second question? Um, this is from a Christian point of view. A lot of it has come up that we feel that angels have been uh, looking after us for quite some time because of the end being near and so forth. Now, Has that ever religious been? religious aspect in a minute. Thank you for calling. First aspect. You got a point? Well, that's highly controversial, and uh, my own fix on you that... Think I think it is extremely rare that anyone has taken on board one of these. I think probably between 90 and 99 percent of those sort of reports are not what they appear to be. Even with the book by the Harvard psychiatrist? Yes. And so I would say that uh, there have been a few accounts where people have been taken on board. I think it is much rarer than uh, UFO followers would have you think. I, I was technical advisor on the UFO incident that's playing uh, today on Turner. and. Uh, I'm convinced that some people have indeed been abducted. Remember, the question isn't, are all the stories true? The question is, are any? Are, the question isn't, are all UFOs alien spacecraft? The question is, are any? Any conflict with religion, as any of you see it? 
I've There's seen this. people who feel conflicted by it. Yes, uh, certain fundamentalist groups say we're the only intelligent life in the universe, and this is the work of the devil. And I don't buy that either. I mean, for them, it's a problem. For me, if you're impressed with the God of our local planet, how much more impressive to think of the God of the local neighborhood? Let's get another call. Virginia Beach, Virginia, with Messrs. Friedman, Greer, and Campbell on our UFO special. Hello. Yes, I'd like to know if there's any truth to the alien ship that crashed and there were seven bodies and they were taken around to different cities in the United States and one of them is supposedly still in Langley, Virginia. Well, Could you address that? Thank you, Stanton. I'm the original researcher on the so-called Roswell incident. Sixteen years I've been plugging away at that. Yes, I'm convinced that a saucer crash, that bodies were picked up and recovered. Where they are now, I don't know. Nobody is telling me. I'm not on the distribution list for the classified documents. Where the wreckage is now, I don't know either. But there is overwhelming evidence that at least one, more likely two saucers, crashed in New Mexico in 1947. Huh. We'll be getting into lots of this, and uh, some of the things discussed we'll be covering as well. And we have another guest joining us. You're watching our TNT special on UFOs. We're in uh, the deserts of Nevada, about uh, two and a half hours out of Las Vegas, and nothing like Las Vegas. I Trust me. guess I believe that there were at least three alien bodies on board this vehicle. Where it ended up, uh, your guess is as good as mine. Is there real evidence of UFOs? Stay tuned. And I'm looking. We're back in Rachel, Nevada. UFO folklore is full of great stories about the evidence that got away, the pieces of a crash saucer, the incredible photos, the little bodies. So there are so many possibilities, but basically two, really. Either it is all just folklore or a very efficient cover-up that has snatched away at all of our conclusive proof. What are we left with? It's what a courtroom lawyer would call the best evidence. You decide how good it is. Hey, do you all have any uh, reports of unknown flying objects over there? No, we haven't. Oh, okay, I was wondering. We supposedly are having quite an invasion over here. Edwards Air Force Base, 1965. What were these military men seeing and chasing? July 1959, Corpus Christi, Texas. What's that bright light in the sky? January 1967, Camarillo, California, on the set of a TV Western. What's that passing behind actor Tony Franziosa? Most UFO evidence in the public domain is fascinating, but inconclusive. Unidentified does not equate to alien spaceship, although many people uh, throughout the world today make that connection. This is amateur tape of an Atlas rocket launch at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, taped in November 1991, but never shown publicly until now. Shortly after liftoff, a mysterious light seems to approach the rocket and change course at high speed. Now, we are not uh, aware, either here at this magazine or any of the other researchers that I'm acquainted with in any technology that the United States government at this time has that could duplicate what this object appears to have uh, completed with this, with this missile test. Still photos are also tantalizing. Some definitely stump the experts, especially this one, where the UFO seems to be kicking up dust. But the photographic evidence doesn't settle debate. It stirs more up. It would be so much more interesting if we were being visited than if we're not. But extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. We had a flying saucer in our possession. Roswell, is it just a dusty legend embellished over half a century, or could it be extraordinary evidence? On July 4th, 1947, something did crash on this lonely New Mexico ranch not far from the Roswell Army Airfield, where A-bombs were stored. The rancher took some of the wreckage to the military. Lieutenant Robert Shirky saw it and says it was covered with strange symbols. Nothing I'd ever seen, and I would just have to say, like hieroglyphics I've seen in the notebooks or 
textbooks, you know, of Egypt, but that still wouldn't be the right answer. The military seized the crash site, but forgot about its own PR man. Without orders to the contrary, he called the local papers. The public affairs officer was Walter Hout. I think KGFL at that time put it on the wire, and they were uh, cut off about halfway through. The next day's paper said that was no saucer. That was a weather balloon. And the manager at KGFL Radio, Judd Roberts, got a warning from a friend in Washington. And just to say, look, if you publish anything, anything that you have information for anything which would indicate that this was something far exceeding the importance of a weather balloon, why, you're in big trouble. Where was the evidence? Reporters were shown wreckage, but maybe not the real McCoy. That was actually part of a Rollins weather balloon. We had a quick switch in there, or so I'm told. In September 1994, the Air Force acknowledged there was a cover-up at Roswell, but denied the secret at stake was a UFO. And it was part of what was then a top-secret project known as Project Mogul, designed to use very high-altitude balloons equipped with in effect microphones or acoustic sensors to try to detect when the Soviets launched, or I'm sorry, when the Soviets exploded their first nuclear weapon. The Air Force offered the Project Mogul story after years of prodding by New Mexico Congressman Stephen Schiff, who was stonewalled when he first filed a routine query with the Pentagon. Well, the response was not routine. The response was a uh, letter from the Air Force that simply said, uh, rather curtly, we've sent your letter over to the National Archives. So for them to re refer me to an agency that they knew couldn't provide any information, I, I think was nothing short of a runaround. Many in Roswell today believe the new Air Force explanation is just another facet of a long-running deception. The town now boasts two UFO museums, which tell the story a lot of people want to believe. I guess I believe that there were at least three alien bodies on board this vehicle that did crash. The Air Force says an internal search uncovered nothing even hinting at a recovered UFO. But a July 1947 FBI memo says an object purporting to be a flying disc was transported by special plane to Wright Field for examination. Wright-Patterson Air Base in Ohio, long the focus of rumors about crashed discs and recovered bodies. I believe that this is an issue of government accountability, that people have a right to know, unless there's an immediate security reason why they can. Schiff is having the General Accounting Office probe further, but few think if the Air Force is still hiding anything, the GAO could really expose it. So hard evidence of UFOs remains elusive. The stories are awesome. The proof is always just out of reach. There's not one case of convincing physical evidence. And scientists would give their eye teeth to get their, you know, fingers on an extraterrestrial technological alloy or something like that. There's never been a case like that. At least not one we know about. We're back with Dr. Stephen Greer, Stanton Friedman, and Glenn Campbell, and we're joined now by a man who's written extensively on the Roswell incident and who believes the evidence is better than we have been allowed to see. He is Air Force Captain Kevin Randall. He's with us here in Rachel. You're in the Air Force Reserves. What got you onto this to begin with, Captain? It was actually my partner Don Schmidt's fault. He thought there was... In other things that needed to be done in the Roswell case. We thought we would go to Roswell. We'd spend three or four days down there. We'd solve the case. We'd go home. Six years later, we still don't know what happened, other than it was a crash of an alien spacecraft. Of that, you're convinced? Absolutely convinced. Right. Now, you're, you're an Air Force officer. Uh, in the inactive reserves, yes. But you were in the active Air Force? Yes, and in the United States Army as a helicopter pilot. What are they hiding? Alien spacecraft, Why? the bodies. I think in 1947, as, as they said, it was something that needed to be hidden. They wanted an opportunity to exploit it without having to worry about espionage. In 1962, the Brookings Institution did a study of what would happen if people of Earth contacted, were contacted by an alien civilization. Of the 15 disciplines, 
economists, anthropologists, theologians, 14 of them have said it would be disastrous for our civilization. We know that the uh, Army participated in civil rights violations in 1947 that they don't want to admit today. And we believe, as other people said, knowledge is power. As long as you ha know something I don't know, you're more powerful. But, but Captain, and, and you co-wrote with Donald Schmidt the truth about the crash at Roswell, right? And you feel and you, you've advised networks and the like, and you've been prominent in this field for a long time. Why would this great story, as Carl Sagan said, the scientist's story of the millennium, the politician's story of the millennium, wouldn't a president love to go on television tonight and say, yes, they're out there? No, I don't think he would. You don't think so? I think a lot of the problem we have is the news media, the scientific community, are afraid of losing their credibility. If you suddenly come out and say, yes, I believe in flying saucers and the United States government has one, and we cannot present you with uh -huh. the hard physical evidence, they don't want to hear that story. If Carl Sagan had that story, he wouldn't break it? If a famous scientist had that story, he wouldn't break it? I think that Carl Sagan has to see physical evidence and Carl Sagan is not looking at physical evidence he says where's the physical evidence right we have 4500 landing trace cases where the UFOs have interacted with the environment there is pieces of metal held in private hands but we cannot get the scientific community to look at this stuff they all say it doesn't exist no one likes security unless a case of national interest so you got to have security during wartime the a-bomb which is not far from here had to be secured and that was hidden very well why does this have to be secure impact on society, Larry. We can't neglect that. Based on what? What impact? What would we do if we knew there was life in another universe? What? What, how would this change my tomorrow? If they were out there... What would I do? Not out, go to Los Angeles? Out what? there, no way. If they're coming here, and if they are abducting people, and if government officials would have to admit they've been lying for 47 years, there goes the next election for all the people who have been lying. So you believe this is a vast political conspiracy between Newt Gingrich and too. Bill Clinton? They both know this. No, I didn't say that. I don't know what they know, but I think they've certainly had advice over the years not to break this story, that it would impact on religion, on economics, on all aspects of our life. The biggest puzzle of all, Dr. Greer, and all of you can jump in on this, it's been asked, I'm interested in your response. Why did they land here and not in Boston? <laughs> well, first of Why? all... Well, the fact Roswell of the matter is, and this, is Washington. this is commonly said, and, and what I point out to people is that in 1952, in July, shortly after we detonated the first hydrogen bomb, or around that time, uh, there were two weekends in a row where they flew in formation over the White House and the Pentagon. There were uh, Air Force people who saw it, airline pilots, a very well no, described phenomenon. they don't phenomenon. land there. Well, but Larry, they do land all over the country. As Kevin said, there are 4,500 physical trace cases. These are right. cases. <laughs> 65 countries where they're seen on or near the ground, and when they leave if you mean why don't they land and charge admission to no climb no on why board? don't they land and talk to land here now what you're presuming that they're here to get on your show or to no, talk no, no, to no, the no. president or whatever <laughs> i'm presuming i presume anything they're presuming obviously they we want to have make contact. to go why with, do they land in deserted areas when there's populated but they, areas but maybe they don't want to talk to earthlings maybe we're not worth talking to but, but you're why also forcing speculate us, you're forcing us to speculate about what's in the alien mind we don't know if we were talking about other uh, races on earth at least we have the commonality of all being human but now we're talking about an alien race and the question that's also raised when they crashed one in new mexico why didn't they come back and pick it up right. glenn has know. the government made a let's say there are no ufos has the government made a mistake in keeping this secret yeah this has generated it let's say there were no ufos <laughs> they perpetuated the they if have. there is a myth they perpetuated they have this is a symptom of the black budget of, of excessive government secrecy where there is no knowledge then folklore will fill the void i'm not saying that this is all folklore here but it would be and that's probably what's confusing but let me say something here i think that the really horse is being uh, the card is being before the horse here and that is that in no other area of scientific endeavor do you have to have proof before you begin investigating it openly and this is a hypocritical standard which uh, i think some people like carl sagan have held up if there's only a one in ten chance that all the evidence that we know of to date indicates that we are being visited by an intelligent life form from another solar system this is one of the most significant things in human history and we do not have to trot out a dead alien body in order to begin to seriously in the scientific community begin to research we need extraordinary investigation that's what we that's need right. why do you think um, so much is going on now captain randall why this sudden upsurge in interest here 
Well, I think one of the problems we have is the Air Force is now on the spot. A lot of people are beginning to listen to our comments about what happened at Roswell. There was a movie that uh, was on Showtime about Roswell. Books are coming out about it. They're suddenly under pressure, and the congressmen are asking what's going on. So they've, they've launched a preemptive strike, if you will, by publishing their report saying that what happened at Roswell was nothing more than a Project Mogul balloon, implying that the balloons of Project Mogul were something special. Let's include more phone calls on our TNT special with Greer Friedman Campbell and Captain Randall. We go to Manassas, Virginia. Hello. Hello. Hi. Yes, good, good evening. My question to the panel is the following. I understand the U.S. government cover up when it comes to the UFOs, but what I don't understand is why the UFOs having all the technology they have, why don't they just land in front of your show or in front or in New York where Let everybody just can ask that, sir, so we'll repeat it again because it does confound people. In well, our wildest dreams, we don't know, we can't think for the alien mind, as you said, but still. Well, if well you, I think what is it you want, Larry? In my lecture, I don't deal with any of the stuff you've seen, our listeners have seen. I deal with facts and data. Five large-scale scientific studies. Uh, is the this biggest one isn't mentioned that, which in is. the 11 anti-UFO books. Project Blue Book, Special Report 14, data on 3,200 sightings. All of the debunkers are aware of it. None of them even talk about it. We don't talk about mysticism about, uh, you know, strange behavior Stan, would you, would out in the wild. Would you stand that this is an advanced culture that can do things we can't do? Well, certainly, uh, one of the laws you learn when you study technology is that progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. The future isn't an extrapolation of the past. The nuclear rockets I worked on aren't just better chemical rockets. Entirely new physics. Then isn't it logical to say, when you say, what do you want? Isn't it logical to say they're studying our culture by only visiting remote areas? But they don't only visit no, remote. Is... They're seen over big cities. They're seen by multiple visitors. There's sightings right over New York. Larry, if, if you I look, could... look at the congressional testimony of 1968, 12 scientists. There's loads of reports, multiple witness sightings over big cities, radar sightings, okay. uh, sightings by astronomers, by pilots, by meteorologists. Whatever you want, it's there if you look. Spring Valley, New York, for our panel. Hello. Uh, yes, hi, Larry. I have a question for your general panel. I understand there's an area not far from where you are in Groom Lake called Area S4. And this Area S4 supposedly has even more high-tech uh, covert black projects in operation right now. I was wondering if any of the panel knows about this. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Glenn? That story comes from the story of Bob Lazar. That he claims that this, uh, these craft he worked on were at Area S4. I have had not have not heard that from other sources. However, uh, Papoose Lake is a very good place to have a secret saucer base. It's many miles behind even Groom Lake. All these people, these 1,500 who work at this Air Force base here, keep this secret. They fly back and at, forth to Las Vegas. They have They're the fear flown, of God. They were flown out here this morning. Uh, not this morning. It's a weekend, but on on weekdays, yes. But let's, let's take it a step further. What happens if they're working on a secret airplane? Okay. Nothing, nothing to have to do with flying saucers, but they're working on a secret airplane. Aren't they keeping that a secret? And they kept the A-bomb, a great secret. Right. One of the, the tens of lots thousands of, of people. Let me point out, you don't have to, to, to look into an, a secret area. Uh, there, in the last three years, there have been uh, hundreds of videotapes of these objects maneuvering over 22 million people in Mexico City. And, and you know, so it's not a question of being if remote I, if or I even in a small plane areas. over there now, what would they do to me? You'd lose your license, yeah. probably. <laughs> it's like flying over the White House. We'll be right back with more and more of your calls. We've got a full hour to go. This is our special live in Rachel, Nevada. We'll be right back. There are what seems to be irrefutable evidence of mysteries that, uh, that uh, strong men with the sane minds have said they saw. Sensational stories and chilling allegations after this. In Rachel, Nevada, our phone numbers are 800-448-3900. 800-448-3900. How much stock do you put in the word of your fellow man? That's really the central question in the UFO debate. Whether to believe the witnesses who step forward and say they saw some hair-raising thing to tell, how good are they? You decide. But first, listen to one of our most distinguished national leaders. 
He's talked to plenty of witnesses, and he's made his decision. I think the government does know. Barry Goldwater, senator, presidential candidate, and believer. I can't back that up, but I think that uh, at Wright Patterson Field, if you could get into certain places, you'd find out what the Air Force and the government knows about UFOs. From his ham radio shack outside Phoenix, the senator disclaims direct knowledge of UFOs, but he does confirm a disturbing story about an exchange with General Curtis LeMay. Reportedly, a spaceship landed and it was all hushed up, quieted, and nobody ever, I've never heard about much of it. I called Curtis LeMay and I said, General, uh, I know we have a room at Wright-Patterson where you put all this secret stuff. Can I go in there? I've never heard him get mad, but he got madder than hell at me, cussed me out, said, don't ever ask me that question again. The most arresting arguments for the reality of UFOs come not from photos or documents, but witnesses, like Robert Dean, retired Sergeant Major, U.S. Army. Dig into this thing and tell the American people the truth. Dean was attached to NATO in Paris in the 1960s. He says a series of UFO incidents over Eastern Europe almost touched off World War III because each side thought they were seeing a secret weapon from the other side. NATO finally launched a secret UFO study, says Dean, and in 1964, he saw the astounding result. I couldn't believe my eyes because it confirmed everything I had ever suspected, that we were really not alone, and apparently the human race had never been alone. And the reality of this thing, the fact that we were dealing with several high-technology extraterrestrial civilizations, and the technology that they had demonstrated repeatedly to the Soviets and to the NATO forces was literally beyond belief. By appearing here, Dean, who now lives in Tucson, is violating his national security oath. NATO has denied the report he saw ever existed, but Dean even claims it contained autopsy reports. The 12 small bodies on this big disk that crashed near the Baltic in 63 were almost absolutely identical. Stories like Dean's can't be verified, but if any of this is true, why aren't the witnesses silenced? Dean believes at least some powerful people in government, people with some of the answers, don't mind him speaking out. He believes if Congress held open hearings, dozens more would step forward. They're asking for congressional immunity for violating their national security oath. And that is not asking a hell of a lot. The most controversial witnesses of all are the alleged abductees. If this is true, it's the biggest event in all human history. Bud Hopkins has hypnotized hundreds of subjects and many alleged kidnap victims, men, women, and children, draw pictures of the aliens with disturbing similarities time after time. There's anger. How can they do this to me? There's perplexity and confusion. What is this all about? No one explains anything to me. And of course, there's an enormous amount of fear. Some of the abduction stories are so strange they're hard to discuss. But many witnesses seem to genuinely believe UFO occupants have stolen their eggs and sperm to manufacture a hybrid race. Such talk does plenty to discourage respectable scientists from tackling UFOs. Then again, a long parade of witnesses do report similar humiliating encounters. The reason for this seems to be that the aliens are experimenting with a genetic uh, mix between their genetic makeup, apparently, and ours, for their own reasons, and we have no idea what that's for. The alleged weird hybrids between alien babies and human babies, which some women say they've been carrying. Fine, let's see the sonograms. Let's see the amniocentesis. What is the evidence? I always felt, uh, it would be a very embarrassing position to be a difficult position to be a prosecutor in a murder case with two eyewitnesses and have Dr. Sagan on the jury because he has to say, I don't care what they saw. We don't listen to what people see, uh, which is an absurd position. In my opinion, those few psychotherapists who have picked up and embraced 
this idea of alien abductions will in time be sued for practicing witchcraft without a license. You might think people subconsciously pining for a close encounter would at least make up a happy story. But many UFO witnesses are far from happy. Some even get injured, like Betty Cash, her friend and grandson. They were driving near Houston one night in 1980 when they saw a glowing, beeping object in the sky surrounded by military choppers. Soon after, all three suffered symptoms of radiation sickness, nausea, burns, headaches, and hair loss. The witnesses sued the government, but their case was dismissed. Despite the misery and risk of ridicule, however, Cash and a lot of UFO witnesses stick to their stories. And not everybody dismisses those stories. I'd like someday to be alive when they divulge all this stuff. He doesn't hold back, does he? Uh, let's reintroduce our panel. Captain Kevin Randall, United States Air Force Reserves, U.S. UFO researcher. Uh, Dr. Stephen Greer, founder and international director of CSETI. Stanton Friedman, nuclear physicist, UFO researcher and lecturer. And Glenn Campbell, Area 51 activist. Okay, what about, let's start with you, Captain. The uh, Air Force story of September 8th, that it was this Project Mogul balloon. What, what's interesting is the Air Force announced in 1947 they had a flying saucer. Three hours later, they said, no, no, it's a weather balloon. Now they've gone back and looked at their files. They said, we lied in 1947. We looked at our files again, and it's a weather balloon. No, no they said they told the truth three days later in 1947. No, they said they, they, they said they lied in 1947. It wasn't a weather balloon. It was a balloon. But they're, they're implying in the report that Project Mogul had some special balloons. They had polyethylene balloons, but according to the Air Force report, the launch they're talking about on June 4th, 1947, flight number four was meteorological balloons, standard weather balloons. Mac Brazel, the man who found the debris, said in the report, which the Air Force cleverly leaves out, that he'd found uh, similar devices on other occasions, and he says, this is nothing like those. He would have recognized them. Why didn't, why didn't Sheridan Cavett, who now says he was with Marcel on the field, he said he recognized it immediately as a balloon, why didn't he bother to communicate this little bit of intelligence to Jesse Marcel? Why did the Air Force, do you think, Stanton release this on September I think, uh, I agree with the notion that it was a preemptive strike. I think it's a terrible piece of work. I've gone through it and the 200 and some pages of attachments, the non-mogul stuff, because I was aware of mogul. And they're internally inconsistent. It's massive misrepresentation. I can only hope, I, I think, that they were trying to delay when the day of reckoning would come. And they would hope that the media, being lazy about UFOs generally, unlike you coming out all the way here, would treat it as a fait accompli. The, the story is over. And the New York Times did that, which really makes me angry. Front page, 60-column inch story with nothing about the special nature of the people who were involved in the group. We're dealing with the only atomic bombing group in the world. We're dealing with outstanding individuals. Not a word about that in the New York Times. I tell you everything you always want to know about Mogul, which is why do you why do you why would the New York Times not want to break this story, Stanton? Come on. I guess why? they. They well, don't the know that there is a story to break. They haven't done their homework, and they refuse to admit that for 47 years they've been guilty of sloppy research. One of the 10 PhD theses that's been done about UFOs, most people ignore that there are any, is about press coverage. And there are scathing remarks in that about the unwillingness of the why, press why would, to do its why job. Wouldn't the press don't ask me willing. why. I'm not a newspaper okay. publisher. The New, York Times, the New York Times took the Air Force report. On its surface, it makes a lot of sense. You read that report, it looks like they've done their homework. I've spoken to everybody in the Air Force report except for Dr. Spillhouse. I've talked to other people the Air Force didn't talk to. Conspicuous by his absence is Brigadier General Arthur Exxon, who says he flew over two sites the site the Air Force claims was Project Mogul, plus the impact site where the craft oh, and the bodies are from. Why do you think the media would not want this story? I think the media should want this story. I the know, so why do you think they wouldn't? Just we don't, as a guess. We don't, we don't get any kind of, 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 of answer for them. I, asked, well, I have I a asked good insight media. into that, and I think that the, the media, unfortunately, uh, have been victims, if I can use that term, like the rest of society, and they have uh, been influenced by the ridicule and the uh, comic relief sort of approach that has been taken to this. And what do you make of the raw that. story we just saw, on that, and Bob Dean rather, in that package about NATO and what he saw? Fascinating, fascinating. That's the sort of evidence I can grasp onto. When we talk about distant craft or abductions, I don't know where to go. But when there is a, an, a, a government connection, that's something that we can get at. 
by, by FOIA requests or by gumshoe work. But I think Bob Dean made one mistake when he said a lot of the people are afraid of the government. They, that's why they're not coming forward. And if they're giving a, an opportunity in front of Congress, they would come forward. I think it, it goes deeper. I think the majority of the people, especially those involved in Roswell, are keeping the secret because they swore themselves, they were sworn to secrecy, they feel honor bound to keep that secrecy. It's not fear of the government, it's their own personal code of honor. That's why they're not talking. There's a real challenge here, Larry. Can we get the Air Force to say that anybody who wants to talk about this non-event in July 1947 is free to do so? A blanket indemnification. By the way, they were asked to appear tonight in the Air Force and uh, did not uh, choose to. Warwick, Rhode Island, as we go back to calls, hello. And they came in front of the car, and then they flew off. What's, what's your question? question? Hello, uh, Larry King? Yeah, what's your question? Um, what is the best course of action to date if you see these objects? Okay, okay. good question. What should someone who sees an object do? Well, I think it depends on uh, their stomach. And uh, what we're training people to do is uh, to actually engage them in some kind of dialogue. But I think that I would caution people not to do that unless they're prepared for the consequences of it. In other what words, if you be careful what you ask for, you may get it. What if you see something weird in the sky? I, th I think that you should attempt, uh, if you are inclined to, to signal to it or in some way communicate with it to see if it's under intelligent control and to get it to come closer. Too many of the sightings are too far away to conclude anything. But if you can get one within a few hundred feet of you at low altitude, you can make some uh, better observations. Would you go public, Glenn? Should someone who watching us tonight who maybe sees an object or has a visit or whatever go public? Well, what does that do? Everyone's gone public. That's a good question. What do you do? And I don't know. Gather as much information as you can using the tools you have with you. That is, what angle is it above the horizon? Don't estimate how big it is. You have no way to judge. What can you hold between thumb and forefinger that will just cover it? Can you call the guy on the other side of it so you can triangulate it? Can you time its flight? from over that church steeple to over that telephone pole. Can you write down as much as you can as soon as possible? Are people, Steve, uh, Kevin, still laughed at? Oh, absolutely. When they report such things? We did a, a press conference in Chicago and talking about the Roswell case, and when they came back from the segment, the, the anchor man said, well, those guys uh, sound almost uh, uh, credible. And my response was, your report was almost objective. <laughs> but with that kind of an attitude, who's going to come forward? New Britain, Connecticut, hello. Yes, hello. Yes. I would like to um, suggest, can we go make a national um, campaign to undercover all this information, you know, because the public is already tired of hearing. What, what has Congress said about there, There's one thing going on. Omni, Thank you. Omni Magazine this month carries what they call the Roswell Declaration in the, in the pages of the magazine. You sign that, you send it in, proving that there's a grassroots interest in that. That would help. I think that's something more important that needs to be done is that on the senior levels of the executive branch of our government and other governments, uh, there does need to be a, a declaration of uh, amnesty from prosecution for violation of security oaths for people. I, I think we all need to become aware that despite what you may have heard uh, tonight in some of the, the pieces, that most people do believe in UFOs, that the greater the education, the more likely to believe. Polls have shown that. But For because they do doesn't mean it's a fact. No, but it means they will be less reluctant to speak out. The professors will be le less reluctant to sponsor thesis no. projects. The media will be less reluctant to cover. Glenn? I don't feel this, this necessarily feel this demand uh, to, to, to make it happen. I think it will happen when, when society re reaches a certain maturity. Uh, uh, we have a president who seems to be opening up everything. DEA uh, reports you think he'd open this up too. Yes. We're going to take a break and come back with more. We're in Nevada on our UFO special on TNT. More calls and more conversation with our outstanding panel. Don't go away. A decision has been made by somebody in government that, Mr. President, I'm sorry, sir, you don't have a high enough classification for some of this information. We can't tell you this whole story. Next, what's the government trying to hide? When the sun goes down in the desert, so does the temperature, and hence the coat. It's getting a little cold. If you think a lot of the UFO lore seems too wild to be true, well, congratulate yourself. You're thinking critically. 
Not everybody does. The field is awash in weird, frightening stories supported by hardly a shed of proof. And in preparing this program, we found some of the wild stories may come from a surprising source. Old rumor, Armstrong and Aldrin saw UFOs on the moon. Newer rumor, the Mars Observer wasn't really lost, but is secretly orbiting the red planet, taking pictures too fantastic and frightening to release. The guy spent 10, 15 years on Mars Observer. Those guys are out of work today. They're not off somewhere and walking out uh, with a secret smile on their face. This is nonsense. This is truly nonsense. Dive into the UFO subculture and you see why establishment scientists don't. Welcome to the world's weirdest rumor mill. Secret alien underground bases, uh, secret alien joint government uh, uh, terrorists uh, performing unspeakable medical procedures on people. Not a bit of, of proof for any of that. We have to ask ourselves, what's the genesis of stories like that? Incredibly, there's evidence that some of them come from inside the government itself. And he pulled out a plain brown envelope. And as he did so, he said, my superiors in Washington have asked me to show this to you. I was out in a place called Crossville, Alabama. Linda Moulton Howe is a TV journalist who probes cattle mutilations and UFOs. While producing a report for HBO in 1983, she says she was invited to Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico by an agent of the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. She was led to a secure room and handed a document which shocked her. It began a very dry and brief summary of, according to this paper I was being shown, the crash and recovery of silver discs in a variety of locations in the southwestern United States and a place in the northern part of the nation of Mexico. According to this paper, there were six of these small, gray-skinned, large-eyed, noseless, slip-for-a-mouth beings, and that one was alive. How was told she'd been chosen to break the story of the century. She was promised official film of saucers and aliens. She told her bosses, then came delays and excuses from her military connection, and ultimately, nothing. HBO lost faith, dropped House project. Was she exposed to genuine secrets or a weird hoax? Either way, what was the point? It seems to be a concerted effort to spread disinformation. Researcher Jenny Randalls had a similar strange experience while probing a 1980 incident at Bentwaters Air Force Base in England. Security patrols spotted a glowing object through the trees and came upon a metallic capsule-shaped thing hovering in a clearing. A U.S. Lieutenant Colonel led a chase and wrote up an official report. But that's not all. A few days after the incident occurred, a, a base security police officer who has never gone on public record since, despite the fact that many of the witnesses have done, um, came out with this amazing scenario of aliens in the forest, uh, contact with the base commander, which almost every other witness I've talked to since has categorically denied had taken place. Why would military sources seek out UFO researchers to peddle wild, uncooperated stories? Many charge it's part of a secret push to discredit them. Dr. Jacques Vallée believes hoaxes conceived in high places have misled investigators and witnesses alike. In fact, I know many of the cases that I have studied uh, turned out to be not UFO cases at all, but uh, manipulations or fabrications that were done not by the witnesses, but for the benefit of the witnesses by somebody else. What's the motive? Some say ridicule. If the idea is to hurt people's credibility, it's worked. And when real events happen, when there are real crash disks or there are real beings that walk into somebody's pasture and they see them, we'll just make sure that ridicule and disinformation immediately follow and that will keep everybody, including the media, from paying any attention. Now, I think that has been of a policy decision. Take the controversial Majestic 12 papers supposedly prepared in 1952 for President-elect Eisenhower. They discuss recovered saucers and alien bodies. 
The paper surfaced in California in 1987, but Linda Howe was shown some of the same language in her odd encounter in 1983. And another shadowy source told Jenny Randalls about Majestic 12 in 1986. If the papers are real, they're astonishing. If they're fakes, they're clever fakes from the same sources who had contact with Linda Howe and Jenny Randalls. Why? This information has several purposes. One, it's to muddy the water. Two, it's to get a little bit of information out in such a way that they want to know how people respond to it. I think possibly the problem is that there are real documents out there which are the smoking gun that everybody is looking for. One answer, mix kernels of truth with dollops of nonsense and feed it to UFO believers with a built-in pension for the bazaar. Presto, deception and confusion. Believers sound crazy, the truth stays hidden. Does that sound paranoid or plausible? We have some very clever people working in our government who have been manipulating the public mind for well over 50 years. Our panel will comment on what we've just seen. We'll take your reactions as well by phone when our special continues. Don't go away. If this is true, it's the biggest event in all of human history. Coming up, more from the most secret place in America. with our UFO cover-up special. This uh, camera is a mile away from where we are. See those lights? That's us. And behind us is this beautiful sunset on this October 1st evening in Rachel, Nevada. Our guests are Kevin Randall, Captain United States Air Force Reserves, and uh, Dr. Stephen Greer, founder and international director of CSETI. Glenn Campbell, Area 51 activist, head of the Area 51 Research Center here in Rachel and the noted uh, nuclear physicist and UFO researcher Stanton Friedman. We'll start with you, Kevin. What did you think of what we just saw there about those uh, tabloids and what they do to this whole story? I personally believe that if, if uh, they didn't exist, the government would be creating that to keep the curtain of ridicule down. General Roger Ramey, commander of the 8th Air Force, in 1947 after the Roswell event said that uh, flying saucers have been seen in 38 states, except for Kansas, which is a dry state implying that if you see a flying saucer, you're drunk. Air Force, uh, the government, everybody still implies if you see them, you're drunk, you're But it crazy. does hurt you, stories oh, like absolutely. Uh, 12 absolutely. senators are aliens. We're all lumped into that category. We're all crazy, and, and they imply that we all believe that sort mm. of thing. Hurt you, do you think, Stephen? Uh, yes, Can't I think help. it hurts the whole field, and I, I'll, I'll say this, that it, I, I'm a skeptic on about a lot of things, and I think about 90 to 95 percent of everything that's written and said and broadcast on this subject is rubbish, and I'll go on record saying that. However, there's a core of it that is true, that is uh, obfuscated by all these other uh, disinformation stories. I think some of them are just human folly. I think some of them actually are deliberately planted into the co uh, culture to put people off the trail. Stanton? A perfect example in this Air Force report on Roswell. The statement is made that the story got big play because the National Enquirer carried an article about Major Jesse Marcel in 1978, and then it says UFO researcher Stanton Friedman, me, uh, then started interviewing witnesses and so forth. The article appeared two years later. It's total baloney, but it sounds great. AP picked up on that part of the story. Totally wrong. Glenn, what do you make of that kind of media approach? I seriously doubt, uh, personally, that there's a lot of government in disinformation involved. I think that ufologists do it all by themselves, just by being themselves. You don't think the government's influencing the globe? Oh, I don't think the government is that powerful. I well, think they could I, drop a few drugs. I think you're absolutely right. And, and the, the thing is, if there weren't the organizations like the Globe to do this, the government would have to invent them. They don't have to do it. They just sit yes. back and let us do it to ourselves. Right. But back to this perplexing thing, we'll get right back to the calls as to why the government doesn't want its citizenry to have information. I'm, it's still perplexing. To well, me. there are very good people in the government who do. And let yeah. me say this. Well, let's, 
we, we've been working, uh, CSETI, and uh, we have a project known as Project Starlight, which has been working with senior people in our government and governments elsewhere. And there are a lot of people who really do want this to come out. The problem is, is that the government is not a monolith, and you have compartmentalized areas of information that a lot of people can't get to. You would be surprised the people uh, in positions of authority who can't get to the information in their own government. Let's go back to, you want to say something? Yeah, there's an important part of this. If an announcement were to be made, really carefully. There would be an immediate push, I believe, on the part of the younger generation for a view of ourselves that would require that we owe our primary allegiance to the planet. We're Earthlings instead of Americans rushing. You mean nationalism would end? Yeah, and no government on this planet wants its citizens to owe their primary allegiance to the planet rather than the individual government. Michael I Rennie's speech at the end of the day, the earth stood still. Uh, let's go to some more calls. San Francisco, hello. Yes, Mr. King. Uh, my question is, my name is David, and uh, I'm originally from Pine Bush, New York, which seems to have a substantial amount of UFO activity and sightings. And what I'm wondering is, is there any research going on in that particular area of the country right now? There's a whole yeah. book about those sightings by Ellen Crystal. Uh, there are a lot of people who go up there for more or less regularly to see sighting, to see UFOs. But the thing I have to point out is I check all my audiences, more than 750 states, nine provinces, all over the place. And typically I find at the end of my lecture when I ask, at least 10% believe they've seen a UFO. But then I ask, how many of you reported what you saw? Only one in 20 of the 10%. Sightings are common, reports are uncommon, what do you, investigations are rare. One night uh, I used to do color on the Miami Dolphin broadcast. We're flying back, I think in 1971-72, beautiful evening forget where we had played and there was a white light off to the right of the airplane where we were like at our altitude it wasn't an airplane it wasn't a star it glowed and got a, le a lesser glow and then a higher glow and then a lesser glow we walked up to the pilot the pilot said i don't know what it is he reported it, it was not on the radar and in about an hour it went away what was that an unidentified so something was, in the uh, sky so i saw a ufo but not necessarily a flying saucer right not necessarily could have been anything right right could have been anything yeah, and, and this is an important distinction that we we try to focus in on events that are close enough range that we can distinguish that it is not something conventional philadelphia hello hi uh dr stephen greer said something interesting uh, early in the show and that was that uh, on several occasions he's uh, signaled these saucers and seen them up close i'd like to ask him if he's ever taken any video or still pictures of these sightings and signalings he's done with them fair question yeah we do have some videotape and still pictures i'm not a videographer or photographer i'm what does it take you put respirator. up a camera and you take pictures well we have people on our team who do that and i think do you, have you shown them everywhere I have shown them. I think we gave them to your producer. I don't know if you're going to show them in the, in the broadcast or not. Uh, and what I would point out to people is that there are dozens of photographs and hundreds of videotapes now. This is not an unusual thing. If the media would spend 10% of the time they're spending on O.J. Simpson or Whitewater to look into this, they would find there's a tremendous amount of good evidence out there. What do you think Goldwater meant, uh, or General LeMay meant when he told Goldwater, got mad at him, don't ask me about this? Yeah, I've spoken to Barry about this, and uh, uh, and Senator Goldwater uh, felt, and, and, I, and I think what was intended was that, yes, there is something there, there's smoke and there's probably fire, and do not ask about it because, I, from what I understand, Curtis LeMay himself did not have access to this area where this stuff was kept. We'll have uh, more on our UFO special from uh, Rachel Nevada on TNT. I'm Larry King, back with our guests, some more phone calls, another very interesting package right after this. I think it's quite clear that the, the, the major powers of the world have access to a lot of information about UFOs. How much do we know? The climax of the mystery after this. It is now cold in Rachel, Nevada. We would be crazy to supply a definitive answer to the UFO riddle tonight. All we're trying to do is take it seriously for a change and ask one hard question most respectable reporters haven't bothered to ask. What do we really know? What if all of us in the world discovered that we were threatened by an outer a power from outer space, from another planet. Ronald Reagan being fanciful or letting slip that he knew something we don't. Questions like that keep the believers in business. Stop the cover up now. Stop the cover up now. 
And the Pentagon may even have vaults that have bodies in them, as well as crash debris from Roswell and other crashes. We don't know until they start telling us what's going on. We just don't have any idea. It's not a, a figment of the imagination of a bunch of lunatics. This is actually a, a reality for people. And people at the Pentagon know about these things. They waited for nearly half a century, hoping to find, to get a piece of credible scientific evidence. They've been disappointed. And so now, in desperation, they charge, oh, the government has that uh, evidence and is withholding it from us. Crash saucers, who knows? But clearly, the government is withholding something. The Air Force answers queries by claiming it quit investigating UFOs in 1969. So why does this once classified memo from 1979 reporting a UFO on the ground in Bolivia get copied to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base? The Air Force even claims it knows of no agency with UFO records other than the National Archives. So what about this mid-70s CIA paper on magnetism, which includes the phrase, this in turn is related to the possible propulsion system of UFOs? If there's nothing to hide, why did the National Security Agency go to court to stop the release of UFO files? This is all the public got to see. If there's no cover-up, why act that way? The cover-up that exists is a cover-up principally of ignorance rather than knowledge. They're desperate to find out what makes these things happen, why they can fly around our atmosphere at will, why they seem to have capabilities far beyond us. There is no incentive for any government to come out and say that they, there is something out there that they don't know. Uh, we pay taxes to be protected, among other things, from uh, unknown things out there. Vietnam, Watergate, and Iran-Contra made government lies and conspiracies seem all the more plausible. What's more, so many self-styled UFO researchers jumped to conclusions, seizing, for example, on President Reagan's offhand talk of threats from outer space as proof that sinister secrets are being kept. To distinguish fiction from fact is uh, not always easy. There are a lot of us who are not interested in making that distinction. They just want a good story. And uh, it is the doleful job of scientists to try to distinguish fact from fiction, hope from reality. So what do we really know? We know the field is so riddled with sensational rumors and wild stories, doing as Dr. Sagan says, picking out fact from fiction is almost impossible. We know many witnesses are not crackpots or publicity hounds, but sober citizens who suffer for coming forward. And we know the government's much more interested in all this than it's willing to admit, whether it's hiding all the answers or just asking the same questions we are. I have never, ever had anything but respect at one level for anyone inside of our government who has been trying to ride this difficult story, not knowing what they were dealing with, not wanting the status quo to suddenly be disrupted for reasons that may not have a, any kind of importance in terms of if there was not a perceived immediate physical threat, then let's wait, let's find out what this is, and then we'll announce it to the public. The problem is this has been going on now for 50 years with a policy of silence. But for 50 years, respectable scientists have turned their back on the UFO question, at least in public. Until that changes, and until the governments of the world unlock those censored files, whatever they hold, what chance do we on the outside really have of solving the puzzle? I'm an optimist. Um, I think again and again in, in the history of science, you've had phenomena that were thought to be ridiculous or were covered up or were repressed, and that turned out to be very significant. So maybe history says we ought to listen to the thousands of witnesses who say they not only think, they know. Something is out there. They conducted autopsies. I saw the photographs. The metal was, uh, had the appearance of the backside of aluminum foil. I get letters from uh, Saudi Arabia, from uh, New Zealand, from uh, uh, Russia. Uh, so the phenomenon is, is extremely widespread. I think the government has an obligation to come forward with the information it has and to make it public. The American people are stronger than their government has ever realized. They're brighter, they're stronger, they're braver, they're more courageous than their government even recognizes. 
I still believe at the deepest level in my heart that this subject will come out, the people will learn the truth, they will deal with it, and they will grow from it and develop and go on from there. Is he right? Will we develop and grow from it? Do we really want to know? I think we have to know. How can we survive as a culture, as a society, if there's information that we're not allowed to know, we're not privy to? How can we make intelligent decisions about what we're going to do in the future if something is kept from us? Yeah, I, I think, too, that perhaps during the Cold War there were reasons to keep this quiet. I don't think those reasons exist anymore, and that if it's done in the uh, proper fashion, if, if an announcement concerning this can be done in, the, in a proper way, that it will be the catalytic event that will lead us into the next millennium in a state of uh, much better than we are now, I think. Or else these people we just saw were lying, Stan. Yeah, I think it's easy to call people liars, Larry, and the noisy negativists, as I call them, often do that without checking their facts, without getting their data straight. I think what's important here is to recognize that the future of this planet is going to be interconnected with space, whether we like it or not at this point in time. Just as North and South America were important for the Europeans of a few hundred years ago, space will be important for our grandchildren and their grandchildren. And as soon as we recognize that we're part of a galactic neighborhood, and maybe we can act in such a way to qualify for admission to the cosmic preschool. I don't think we even get into kindergarten yet. Uh, the better off we will be. And some people are fearful. Sorry about that. Glenn? I really question how important the aliens really are. I, 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 really? I, I think that fundamentally we, we retain our humanity. Our, our, our world is here. If they are out there on the moon or circling around or coming and taking our cattle, that doesn't really change our, our life here. We still have to be human. If the story hits, the government releases some Im information, we still have to go back to our jobs the next we still, day. Everybody's got to do what they got to do tomorrow. That's right. Uh, but they have more knowledge, at least, of the world they, around They them. will. A uh, couple more calls. Franklin, West Virginia. Hello. Hi, Mr. King. I have a question for your general panel. Can you speculate how long the government will be able to keep not only the mission of Area 51 a secret, but what they really know about UFOs a secret from the general public? How long, Kevin? As long as uh, the curtain of ridicule exists, as long as people are afraid to come forward because they don't want to be ridiculed. I mentioned earlier President Clinton's opening up all the agencies, Agent right. Orange, right. Uh, diseases from sure. 30 years ago, Department of Energy has done a spectacular job. Don't yeah. you think he yeah, I, I think I think this administration is inclined to come out with the truth on a lot of things that have not been uh, disclosed in the past. The problem is is how much they can get in terms of information. And I, I reiterate that the government is not a monolith. It's a hugely complex entity. And there are uh, activities in the government which uh, many people at the top are not aware of. And so I, I think that the people have to help uh, the executive branch and Congress become aware of this in a way that's credible. And that's what we're trying to do. Does it confound you, Stanton, when in your heart as a physicist and in your mind and beliefs, you know this to be a fact? and the general consensus of the body politic laughs at you. They don't laugh at me, and there have been polls of engineers and scientists, Larry, that show that a majority of them believe they're real. Right. So you I've, don't think you're on the out? I've no. spoken at 100 professional groups, and they respond beautifully. Los Alamos National mm -hmm. Laboratory, management clubs. It's Denver, their Col that's Denver Colorado, hello. Uh, yes, Mr. King. I, uh, in our area, we have numerous uh, cattle mutilations, animals that disappear. Local news never says a word. What kind of research, what kind of area are we getting into with these? Oh, about 80% of those, I think, are uh, decoy events, uh, probably perpetrate, meaning. Uh, meaning that they are probably done by some uh, branch of the military or intelligence services. There's a core of 10 to 20% that are probably animal experiments uh, for reasons which uh, we don't know. And I, I disagree with that. I would say that 99% of the animal mutilations are probably uh, natural mm -hmm. phenomenon. Surmise something for me, Glenn. I only have a few <laughs> minutes left. What's, what's going out there? tonight uh, like if the phone rings what's the number what's the number yeah. area 51 what's the phone number i don't know all right what is the 702 702 what is the, right. 702 something. What does the switchboard <laughs> operator say who's there oh, what are they the, doing gosh i wish i knew but things guess? are going to change now I, the, the, we are at a, a, a crossroads as they say uh, we at this point in history 
things are, are different now. We do not have this Soviet threat that all this secrecy was hidden behind. Right. You can hide anything behind uh, our, our, yeah. our dire enemy. What do you think is going on out there now, Kevin? I think that there's just experimentation on the next generation of fighter or bomber aircraft. You think there's any uh, alien evidence out there, too? I don't think so, but you that's my personal opinion. Person. I don't think it's involved out there, no. Dr. Greer. I, I honestly don't know what's going on at Area 51. I will say that uh, I, I'm certain that there are current operations that dealing with deep space network and uh, telemetry into space and what have you, uh, where people are aware of the movements of these spacecraft in real time. And what I'd like to focus on is not things that happened 50 years ago, but the fact that here tonight somewhere uh, there is activity uh, which can be traced and can be documented. And what we need to do is to trim t uh, somehow to establish uh, contact with whoever is behind this phenomenon. All right. when do you I think, Stanton, your evidence, as you see it, will be accepted. I don't know that it's been rejected. It hasn't no, well, been I mean, presented in the right places, I guess. I'm an optimist. I think, again, because of Hazel O'Leary on your show, talking about Bill Clinton and the Department of Energy, 33 million pages of stuff. And since they weren't involved in the beginning of the cover-up, that they will have guts enough to open the door to the data. And I think that'll happen within the next few years, before the end of the century. <laughs> Funny thing to say. And do you think another thing might happen? Uh, Glenn, do you think maybe they'll come to Washington, these aliens, and say hello? I have the feeling, personal, that they probably obey the prime directive, and that comes from Star Trek, that they should leave us alone and, and let us conduct our own lives. They seem to not want a lot of attention. Let me say, though, I do think that within the decade that uh, it is likely that an undeniable event will transpire. There are the proliferation of video cameras and other technologies are such that some of the events that had happened and waves of UFO events that had happened in past decades, if they were to happen now in 1994, there is a, a higher and higher chance that this would uh, result in undeniable evidence. Are you encouraged that this administration would help? Yes, I Therefore, do. Therefore, you think President Clinton does not now know what you may know? I, I really shouldn't comment on that. What does that mean? That's a mysterious. <laughs> well, I, I just, I just don't. Uh, what I think is that the current administration and cabinet level people are probably not informed to, to where they should be, and to the extent they have been informed, it has probably been disinformation and not information. Kevin, optimistic or pessimistic? Oh, looking at the history of our government in the last 50 years, I'm fairly pessimistic. pessimistic. I, think, I think it will take some kind of an outside event for us to really learn what's going on. Glenn? I'm neither optimistic or pessimistic. If the story hits, it will cause a big stir in the media for a while, but we'll go back to our regular lives. Just for a while? Come on. Well, picture Hard o copy will be there tomorrow yeah, morning up the in Pluto. Picture the O.J. Simpson, <laughs> picture the o. J. Simpson uh, brouhaha and, and multiply that by 10 and maybe you might have the, the UFO thing. Sex uh, in space. Uh, uh, be <laughs> I think it'll be bigger than that. And I'm, I, and I, I'm and an I think, I, I, I think that what you'll see is a transformation in the way we look at ourselves as a people. We will be, evolve into a global society in, instead of national ones. Are you optimistic? Uh, Yes, I'm very optimistic, in fact. And you, Stanton? I'm optimistic. I'm concerned that the American people are nowhere near enough aware of how much stuff is being covered up as we speak. The huge black budgets, all the documents, that scares me. Thank you all very much for being a terrific panel and for participating in this show that started in daylight at an end in darkness. Our guests have been Kevin Randall, Captain United States Air Force Reserves, Glenn Campbell on the far end, Air F Area 51 activist Dr. Stephen Greer, and Stanton Friedman, nuclear physicist and UFO researchers. This has been another one of our series of TNT specials. We do these about twice a year for our sister network. Our regular home is Larry King Live on CNN. We thank you very much for joining us. We hope that you learned a lot tonight and found it both entertaining and informative at the same time. We also want to thank everybody associated here in this wonderful little spot on our treasured earth called uh, Rachel Nevada for their wonderful cooperation and this great crew as well, our producers and the entire staff. Thanks for joining us. Have a great time and bye.
alien invaders abducting innocent humans for unspeakable medical experimentation? UFO Watch 94 continues as James Earl Jones and Estelle Parsons become unwilling subjects of extraterrestrial examinations in the chilling thriller, The UFO Incident, next on TNT.